Um, welcome, everybody. My name's Jeff. I've been here for a few years as a youth pastor and whatever, and I'm glad you're here with us in person and online. I was going to do Dusty, Pastor Dusty's thing, but that's his shtick, so I'm going to let him say what he says. Um, I like to do uh, some uh, stuff about where we're at with the youth group, what's going on in the life of the youth group. I can't take it for granted that you know everything. I do have a, a Monday email that I send out every week. Um, I don't know, it's maybe 18 years straight now, it's 15 to 18 years, every Monday, almost without fail, um, even when I don't feel like I do it. I feel, even when I don't feel like it, I do it. Um, but if you'd like to get on that email list, uh, well, figure it out and we'll put you on it. Um, but uh, yesterday was our District Celebrate Life, formerly known as Momentum, and uh, it was a great day. Uh, we had quite a few students go up there and participate. Um, yes, 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 almost all of them. And uh, what a great day to, number one, see kids use their talents, their abilities, their gifts to bring glory and honor to God. Uh, some sang, some played sports, some played chess, some got beat at chess, some got hit in the face with a dodgeball. Right, Lewis? And uh, it just a lot of things happened throughout the day. But it was a great day. I'm always proud of our students. Um, when we go down the regional celebrate life, they're the youth group usually that is like, hey, what do we need to fill in? What positions? And they, they help out. Uh, they exhaust themselves over um, that three days we're down there. Um, so they're a great group of kids. It's so fun working with them. And I think, did I see Doug and Kendra? I did. So they, we were cohorts together for years for Momentum, 15 years, something like that. I don't know the, the actual number. And yesterday was the first time that I did it completely without them, and I realized everything they do. And yesterday I was like, man, I wish they were here, because um, I just don't like the paper side of it as much. But anyway, we got through it. I learned two valuable lessons yesterday that will be fixed for next year. If you don't know what District Celebrate Life is, well, maybe get on my email list and you'll know. All right. Um, we're also, the youth group, we've got eight students going to Nazarene Youth Conference. Who here has had, who has been to Nazarene Youth Conference? Raise your hand. Who had a student go to Nazarene Youth Conference? Who had a grandchild uh, go to Nazarene Youth Conference? So that's a, a lot of you. Um, we're working our way to Tampa this summer. Um, as you guys know, everything went up in price, and that includes stuff within the church. Uh, you know, Tampa's not like, hey, you're a church. It's free. They're not going to do that. So um, we have to stay in Tampa, we have to get down there, we're flying down. So we've been raising money this year on Friday nights, that's usually the second, but this month it is the third Friday night, it's March 17th, uh, St. Patrick's Day, and we have a dinner coming up. And so if you're not busy, I mean, you're not going to be going to the bars, <clears throat> right? Uh, so why not come here and hang out with us, eat some corned beef, some taters and carrots and cabbage, uh, excellent dessert. But even more important than all that, you're going to get an opportunity to hang out with our students, to interact with them, play games. Um, I haven't heard anyone say they hate that part. Um, and um, you also get to invest in their lives. And uh, I can't think of anything better within the church. So anyway, I hope you'll join us. You can uh, sign in online, all right? I'm pretty impressed with this, Pastor Dusty. I know. But I feel like my sermon's going to be better because of this. <laughs> I know people are praying that it will be better because of this. Um, I don't know. I feel pretty professional up here today. So, well, let me pray, and then I'm going to get into what God has laid on my heart. All right? Father, thank you for this morning, and I pray that your spirit would be in this room that our hearts would be in tune with you, and that you would speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. May we put away the distractions. May we got things going on in life that are um, weighing down on us. But for this next 20, 30 minutes, Lord, I pray that we'd be able to put that to the side, trust you, knowing that you are good, and you're going to help us through those situations and hear from you today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So I went on vacation uh, about a month ago. Um, I, I didn't grow up going to vacation on vacation. So when I moved here to Michigan and everyone's talking about going up north and doing all this stuff, I'm like, what is this thing going on? Anyway, we didn't go up north. We went to Florida, so, um, which is what you should do in February. And um, 
we've been doing this for, I don't know, third or fourth year in a row, maybe fifth year, I don't know. And we went down there. There was eight of us, so Rachel's parents, our niece, my daughters, and little Roman, and Rachel and myself. And so there's eight. So a seven-passenger minivan just doesn't work for eight people. So we got down there, and uh, they had an 11-passenger van we rented. I walk out to the Alamo stable there to get my van. There's only 15 passenger vans left, exactly like the one out there. <laughs> so I'm in, I'm like, oh, I guess this is what we got to do. It was black, but it was exactly the same. And um, the lady at the desk says, uh, do you have any experience driving a 15-passenger van? <laughs> and I said, you don't know the story. Um, so I drove a 15-passenger van with eight people around for a week through Miami, Fort Lauderdale, all the way down to Key Largo. And funny story, we went uh, on a glass-bottom boat to watch um, stuff you really can't tell what it is. I'm trusting the lady. She said it was a turtle. I'm trusting it was a turtle. Um, but she was saying all this stuff, and everybody was getting sick. Um, I had took the Dramamine, okay? They offered it. I took it. Most of my family did not. About 15 minutes into the, the glass bottom viewing, there was way more barfing than viewing going on. Not just my family, the whole ship. And it... <laughs> I didn't think of it when it was happening. We were in line, and there was an Amish family behind us, and they had the biggest box of fried chicken and potatoes I have ever seen eating it as they're getting onto the boat. And, yes, every one of them was leaning over the edge of the boat. Um, it, was, it was rough. But we went down there. That's not the story. The story is the traffic. Unbelievable. I'm complaining about traffic, people everywhere. What are all these people doing? And then I remembered, oh, yeah, I am traffic. I'm part of the problem, right? We all, you've, have you ever complained about traffic and then realized, wait, that's, I'm part of that, all right? So it, it's that week also I was reading through a, a Lent devotional that I started a week early because I am just super spiritual that way. And because I had my weeks off is why. And the author said that, and I, I totally jived with this a few years ago, but I read it again. He said he got rid of the statement, love the sinner, hate the sin. He does not say that anymore. He says, love everybody and hate your own sin. I love that, okay? But I'm sitting there thinking the old statement, love the sinner and hate the sin. I'm thinking, you know what? We're all sinners, it's like the traffic. I'm traffic. We are all in this together. At one point or another, you hit an entry ramp onto salvation. There is a part of our lives where we are sinners. Okay? And so today I want to read from a, um, the book of Luke, chapter 18. This is the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read it in the NIV. And then I'm going to read it in the message, and then I'm going to try and go through it using the message a little bit. All right? So just hold on today. Um, hopefully it all comes together. I don't know if I mentioned this. I was at Momentum all, or Celebrate Life all day yesterday. And uh, so I didn't do much of this yesterday, but I tried to be a proactive on Thursday and get this done. So here we go. You ready? All right. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I give. I get, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's some tough words, all right? And you got to know, he's talking there, his audience is right there, all right? You know, in, if you read the scriptures, stones were everywhere. I don't know what, where they were, but every time someone said something wrong, stones were available to be picked up and thrown 
I don't know if they carried them or what. They, you know how baseball players have bat bags? Maybe Pharisees have stoning bags. I don't know. But anyway, let's read this from the message, all right? He told this story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at the common people. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax man. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this, O oh God, I thank you, I am not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, and heaven forbid like this tax man. I fast twice a week and tithe on all my income. Meanwhile, the tax man, slumped in the shadows, his face in his hands, not daring to look up, said, God, give mercy and forgive me, a sinner. Jesus commented, this tax man, not the other, went home made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to, get, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. God bless Eugene Peterson. What a great uh, translation that is. All right, so let's just work through this kind of line by line, however you want to say that. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, I love the message. He told his next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at the common people. So who is Jesus addressing in this parable? The religious leaders, the church people, the in crowd, the ones who created the moral code and had become the morality police of their day. And they had a manual to wield and the power to wield it. It's interesting because in this story, um, kind of like the Good Samaritan, Jesus flips the script and makes the hated one the hero. And I say that in quotes. There's not a lot of difference between, thank God I'm not a Samaritan and thank God I'm not a tax man. And before we go too f much further into the story, let's make sure we have a really good perspective on these characters. Because I believe over the years, we've labeled Pharisees as the bad guys and the tax man kind of like the good sinner. Like, he's kind of cool. All right? And there is something we can learn from him, but I don't think um, that's the right way to look at it. So a tax man, tax collector. Um, who were they? All right? So we all understand that uh, Israel was under occupation of the Roman Empire. And um, so tax collectors were very hated. I mean, we're not, they're not liked in our day and age either, right? Um, but a tax person was a person who saw the opportunity to get rich by betraying his own people. It's interesting that a tax collector shows up 24 times in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were considered really bad, okay? It's like... You had sinners and tax collectors. It's not like sinners, you know, tax collectors fall under that umbrella. You've got to have a separate category for them. They were so bad. And in um, Matthew, okay, is one of the places where he um, mentions tax collectors in the parable of the two sons. The one said, the father said, hey, go do this. And the one son said, no, I don't think I will. And then he did. And let me just tell you, in my own testimony, in my own life, that was kind of my reaction with God a lot growing up. All right, God would say, Jeff, do this. I'd be like, oh, I don't want to. But then I would go. All right? My initial reaction was a little resistant. But then, thankfully, I don't know what it was about my life, but I would go and do what God asked me to do many times. Or you had the other story of the father or the boss or whoever it was saying, hey, go do this. Okay, I will. And then that person never did. All right? And then at the end of that story, it says this. Jesus says, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. He's saying this to the religious people. For, God, for John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. All right, so the tax collectors I mentioned a lot. All right, if you read your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're going to read a lot about tax collectors. They were hired by the Romans. The Romans uh, were not the good guys either. They would go into a territory. They would want to zap as much money to fund their empire as they could, take it from the people. They didn't do it themselves. They would hire a Jewish person or a person of that nation. And they, they would employ them to go out and collect the funds. So the way they would do it 
it was almost like an auction. So they would have like um, a bunch of ruffians. All right, let's just get the CPA guy with the tie and a short sleeve button up shirt out of your mind. Most of these guys were like bullies, were part of the mob, the mafia. They were not little guys. All right, these were guys probably on the wrong side of the tracks kind of guys. All right, um, they would be hired, they would make a bid, say, hey, you know what, I can bring in 800 whatever. Another guy, well, I can bring in 850. And the Roman Empire would be like, okay, you get the job then. And then they would try and raise 1,500, let's say, so they kept a whole bunch of it. I mean, it was, it was the mob, all right? It was the mafia going around collecting this money. They used threats. Um, they used extortion to get in to fund their, um, the Roman government. It said, I read this today, in today's culture, the closest e social equivalent would be drug pushers and pimps. Those who prey on society, who make money off of others' bodies and make a living of stealing from others. These guys, I'm guessing, were pretty bad dudes, the mafia types and bullies. Now, Pharisees, we don't want to be a Pharisee, right? But Pharisees started out like the good guys. I mean, really good guys, all right? They came into existence about 160 B.C. in the Seleucid Empire. And they... When the Seleucid Empire was under Anicus the Fourth, those words are hard for me to say. I don't know. I have Seleucid, Seleucid Empire. All right, under Anicus. Um, and ticket. Wait, that guy, the guy, and and now I'm all flustered with him. So anyway, he wanted them to become part of their culture. You know what this guy did, Anicus? He would not allow Jewish people to circumcise their kids. He would force pork into their diet. He would not allow them to meet, um, to observe the Sabbath. He was doing everything to squish down the Jewish identity, all right, socially and religiously. And these Pharisees began and started because they wanted to maintain their identity, and they understood that, well, first off, the word Pharisee means set apart or holy, okay? And so they wanted to keep their identity, and so they started helping the people by, with good motives to observe the things it meant to be a Jewish nation following Yahweh, all right? So it started with good intentions, but like most human endeavors, it became an institution. And by the time of Jesus, they had become the morality police, Here's something interesting is Jesus is pro probably closest to the, the Pharisees. And that's why I believe he had the hardest words for them. He was rough on them. They had lost focus, lost the beat, and were out of step with the will of God. The Pharisee, most of us agree, would regard him as a good man. He was committed to his local synagogue or church. He paid his tithes. Pastor Dusty, you like that? I like that. Right? He was a family man. They took marriage seriously. He was serious about his faith. He was committed to God and his nation. The tax man, on the other hand, well, how do you guys respond to a letter from the IRS? Right, enough said. If this is a story about a good guy and a bad guy, the Pharisee is definitely the good guy in this story. So, as the story continues, it says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax man. Two sinners. I know, I know, I'm going to get pushback. But we're all saints. I do. I get that. But, you know, being a saint, it's good to have the right perspective on where we came from. All right? And I just remembered. Oh, darn. I was going to have stickers today. They said, hello, my name is, and I was going to have a sinner on it. And I was going to pass it out and just do a social experiment to see how many of you would put it on and identify that way and how many of you wouldn't. And I forgot. I'm going to blame District Celebrate Life. All right? But I say that we all are sinners. We all started that way. We all are sinners saved by grace. In my journey as I follow Jesus, I, you're not going to believe this. I said a prayer when I was young, and I have not been perfect since then. I know. Um, shocker. I actually have stumbled my way as I continue to follow Jesus. It has not been pretty. There have been times where I have blown it so, so badly that if it weren't for my upbringing, I probably would have said, God, you can't, he can't be with me anymore. He just won't want to be with me anymore. But thankfully, I understood that I had a, a pastor who said, 
a, a Christian is someone who continues to follow after Jesus even when they stumble, even through the hard times, just step by step by step. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It has to be consistent, and it has to be following after him. Um, and so as I'm sure as many of you have been, I'm, I don't I can say all of you, but I'm sure most of you, as we are following after Jesus, we sin. We do. We have those times when we fail. We don't reach the mark that God wants us to, to reach. And so I think it's okay to say a sinner like me. Okay? Um, we all are in that boat. So both the Pharisee and the tax men were sinners, and both were praying to God. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this. Uh, oh, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, and heaven forbid like this tax man. Have you ever prayed, and you're more concerned about what's happening over here? Right? I mean, that's a bad sign right there. All right? I fast twice a week and tithe on all my income. All right, I am 50. I just turned 55 this past week, I know. I don't, I feel it, but I don't feel like I look like it. Not the reaction. Okay. Um, Calissa, you don't get to answer that. She's like, Jeff, you look old either way. I shaved my beard off, and everyone's like, ah. And I'm like, so in my 55 years, I've been in church every, all the time. Like the very first Sunday I was alive, uh, my mom and dad drugged me to church. I have heard a lot of bad prayers in my time in church. I have prayed a lot of bad prayers. I'm sure some people are like, ugh. All right. Many times a prayer is just a second sermon. Those are the worst. Um, other times they're missile prayers aimed at somebody seated in the crowd instead of to God. I thought our prayers were to our Heavenly Father. All right. And so this Pharisee, he is so aware of the presence of this sinner in his midst that it clouds his own self-awareness the presence the presence of this tax man has so triggered him using modern uh, words there that he falls into the devil's game of comparison he is trying to justify himself by comparison so um i did a lesson uh, a few months back called the signature move, the devil's signature move, all right? And I compare, you know, like Michael Jordan had the whatever move, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Not that I know a lot about basketball, but he had the signature sky hook, all right? This devil's signature move is lying. That's his signature move. And his signature game is comparison, all right? If you start comparing, uh, it's terrible. So um, one of the reasons I'm anti-social media is because of the comparison game. The outcome for many is depression, anxiety, poor self-esteem, poor body image, and like a lot of disorders in reading and relate relationships, eating and relationships. All right? Um, when we start comparing, we start to lose the focus on who God has created us to be. And this Pharisee, his prayer is based on a comparison. All right? He addresses God and then goes into his list of things why he's okay. Meanwhile, the tax man, slumped in the shadows, his face in his hands, not daring to look up, said, God, give mercy, forgive me, a sinner. Now, the tax man, on the other hand, is unaware of the Pharisee and sees only his own sin. Forgive me, a sinner. This guy has nothing to hang his hat on. No one below him that he gets to, like, say, I'm better than him. He's completely at the mercy of God, and he has put all that he has on that mercy. And Jesus commented, this tax man and not the other went home, made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. Made right, we will be made right with God. To be made right is to be justified. A person can try to justify themselves, the Pharisee, or they can trust God to justify them, them, the tax man, but you cannot do both. A Pharisee will try to justify themselves. The tax man was trusting God to justify him. You cannot do both. Two sinners, the Pharisee, proud and obtuse, self, lacking self-awareness. The tax man, humble and self-aware. 
Humility is daring to be honest with yourself about yourself. And when you do this, it allows the grace of God to invade your life. There's a thing out there, I think you probably all heard it called the Jesus Prayer. And it goes simply this, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's real simple. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I've been around a long time, like I said earlier, and like I said, I mentioned, um, you know, love the sin or hate the sin. And I've heard this a lot. Uh, preacher, not said to me, but I just heard it. Preacher, you need to preach more on sin. All right? Preacher, you need to preach more on sin. Now, most of the time, when people say that, they mean someone else's sin. Right? I want, if you want to say that, preacher, you need to preach more on sin, then you tell us what your sin is, and we will preach on it. All right? I think that would be great. <laughs> you, we will get no one coming up. And that's what's going to happen. All right? Listen, that's the focus again on your own self-awareness and who you are. And so today, the challenge is kind of this, is if you're focused on someone else's sin, we need to take the words of Jesus and really think about where we stand with him. All right? Now, yes, we care about people. Yes, we want to help them. But man, it, a lot, the Pharisee was not worried about the state of the tax man improving. He was trying to justify himself by pointing at him. We dare not find ourselves in the place of the Pharisee, focusing on their speck of sawdust, or maybe even a little bit bigger, all right, while we have a plank coming out of our own face. I'm tired of Christians pointing fingers online, hearing partial videos out of context, or hearsay gossiping, ugh, all that stuff, gross, while the world is watching us and seeing what Jesus is like. All right, we got to be careful. Um, I, I, I think there should be none of that online, but that's me. All right, you can disagree. You've probably heard the saying, love the sinner, hate the sin. And like I said, I used to say that. It allowed me to feel a little bit higher than those I was dealing with. I mean, you normally point down the sinners. I like to say now, like I said earlier, love everyone and hate your own sin. I've been lucky enough to be a part of every other Tuesday night CR. Um, big fan of it, all right? I love how they introduce themselves. I'm a grateful follower of Jesus who struggles with fill in the blank, and my name is fill in the blank. All right. Now, as, as Wesleyans, we don't believe that we're the scum of the world. All right. You know, the Calvinists think we're worms and, you know, whatever. It's terrible. We believe we're created in the image of God and we're just missing the mark. All right. God created us a certain way and because of sin, we missed the mark. But I think it's also very helpful to realize where we have come from. Repentance is a daily thing in my book. And I'm going to use my illustration I use all the time. It's like canoeing. If you don't adjust the, the direction of your canoe, you're going to end up in the ditch or in the, the weeds, reeds, the side. All right? I pulled out many a student uh, from those sides of the, the river. All right, every day, put that paddle in, or in, put the paddle in the water. Keep it down the middle, where God wants us. You know, you're going to get off a little bit. Okay, I got to adjust. That's repentance every day. That's kind of coming, saying, "All right, God, I am not perfect. I am a sinner. I need to adjust every day. Take up your cross." All right, this isn't a I got saved and sanctified back in the in some date a decade ago. This is a daily walk with Jesus. We got to stay that way. Paul refers to himself, and I, if Paul does this, I think we should do this a little bit. The Bible doesn't refer to Paul this way. Paul refers to himself as the chief of sinners. The guy who wrote the, most of our New Testament refers to himself this way. And I think if he's doing that, um, you can come on up, uh, we should do that as well. All right? So what's the goal? What's the purpose of this story? Jesus is trying to break down our pride. We can't earn, we can't merit God's grace. He's trying to point out that we need to have the right attitude in prayer. Our works, I think the scriptures say, are like dirty rags. They really don't hold up. We can't, they can't measure up to what God is asking us. Jesus shows us how we should pray. Not with pride, comparing ourselves to others, but in humility, need, needy for God's mercy. 
We need to be honest with ourselves and about ourselves. And the kingdom of God is made up of people who love everyone and hate their own sin. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning, I thank you again that we get to gather in your name, knowing that you love us, that you're there for us in this journey as we follow and trust you, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak into our lives, Lord, and if we find ourselves more on the side of the Pharisee, Lord, we're proud of our accomplishments, and if we have all this list of things where we compare who we're not, Lord, I pray that your spirit would convict us. Help us to see that that is prideful. And pride is one of the main sins, Lord, that's hard to overcome. Lord, maybe if we're like the tax man and we're just broken and we just are lost right now, I pray, Lord, that we would trust you. Lord, I pray every day as we continue to follow you that we would have the heart that says, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. It's in your name we pray. Amen.